Thanks, Elaine. Thanks for having me. Um, yeah, we've had a few technical difficulties in some of these trying times, but let's go on the 96% Bosch furnace. Um, like Elaine said, a uh, fairly new product to us, a few years old, and um, has been very well received in the market. So we'll give you kind of a little bit of it. Um, I'm going to give you a little introduction to the Robert Bosch Corporation why you should use it, tell you a little about the furnace, um, how it works, some basics, some troubleshooting basics, how to handle some warranty claims, what are some of the uh, the frequently asked questions you guys are gonna answer or ask more questions at the end. And if you do have questions, please feel free to answer. I'm, I'm happy to answer pretty much everything. If I don't have an answer, we'll get right back to you on it. Um, uh, a few spare parts, comments, a little about our ABC contractor program and kind of where to find further education and further support like this. So I came out of the trade, I spent 40 years in the plumbing and heating trade, um, came to work for Bosch um, as a tech support agent. Worked there for four years. Um, Tom Bowen retired from training and I moved into the training position. It's a nice place for me to be. Um, but because I came out of the tech support, I, I feel a need to kind of help guide you guys if you need to call tech support in, in some of the easier ways to get around things. So first thing is try to be on site if you can. If you're not, have as much as you can with you. The frontline service or frontline operators are gonna give you a customer number for that. But in order to do that, they need a model serial number um, if possible. They also need, um, customer information. You gotta know where you're working. Um, and, and a lot of times it's, uh, you ask, well, where are you working? What's the address? Well, I don't know. You drove there, so you should know. So those things like that help move things along and help the tech support guys do a better job. Once you have that customer number, that goes with the unit for its lifetime. Anytime you call in from there, there's a record for that unit and that record stays with it. So you call in two years from now, we're gonna to add to that record, or they're gonna to add to that record. Um, try to have some fault codes if, if you can. Um, the basics, uh, gas pressures, electric voltage, do some basic troubleshooting, take the cover off of it. See what you've done. See if you can find those fault codes in there. Um, have gas pressure. Most important tools you might have, your brain, your senses, eyes, ears, hands. Is it hot? Is it cold? Is it making funny noises? Is it moving? Is it glowing? That type of thing. Um, and then you must have, if you're gonna work on any kind of gas unit or even oil, um, you've gotta have a manometer, you've gotta have a multimeter and you've gotta have an analyzer. If you don't, you shouldn't even be on that job. No proper tools, people get hurt. So be safe, um, don't leave a job until everything is checked out thoroughly, no gas, um, check for carbon monoxide poison or, or leaks. Um, pretty easy to do with a decent analyzer. I'll tell you right away if you got any CO coming into the room, into the building, and then make sure in your venting the CO levels are, are correct. Bosch is set up. Bosch itself, um, as a worldwide company, somewhere around 460 subsidiaries, 60 different con countries. Actually, a few more than that now. Um, somewhere around ninety-three billion dollars sales revenue, two thousand eighteen. We're a little bit higher than that now, and around four hundred and ten thousand associates worldwide. So, big, big company. Um, the Bosch family actually owns about eight percent of the corporation. The rest of it is run as a nonprofit. Um, and they do a lot of work um, in grants and research and um, all kinds of different developments throughout what Bosch does. So we contribute back to the world and to the people a lot. Uh, it's, it's actually run to contribute back. Um, the global overview for TT, which is thermal technology, about 14,000 associates for thermal technology, about 100 years in the market. They invest around 205 million bucks into 
research development in about 90 countries in um, commercial residential heating, hot water, and cooling. So pretty good size. When you're selling or working with Bosch, you're selling that brand. You're selling in a, you have a little bit of an advantage because of the brand. People know what Bosch is. They see Bosch everywhere from windshield wipers to heating, cooling, appliances, um, all different components in vehicles, you name it, Bosch is in it. A lot of sensors and stuff like that are being done. The Bosch deals a lot with um, automated driving now. So it's getting to be quite a, a diversified company. And within the TT market or thermo technology market, getting quite diversified. We have quite a few products on the market as far as heating, cooling, heat pumps, geothermal, um, water heating, elect both electric and gas. And some of those are here in our residential portfolio. On the heating side, we have residential boilers, combi boilers, um, residential all the way through commercial boilers and our furnace as well in the heating only end. We get into the next phase over with the, what we're calling cooling on this slide. Um, so heating as well, because we do heat pumps, we do mini splits in case you weren't aware of that. So we have a heat pump series of mini splits that go up to four heads each. Um, five on the, on the largest model, um, but a lot of versatility there. Geothermal, we're into that. In water heating, we're in from point of use electric to small tanks to um, multiple gas high efficiency units. So we can run multiple units for commercial application in our 9900 series. And in some of the control stuff we have, we have a lot of different controls throughout the, the lines. Um, a few of the ones of interest are our BCC 50 and our BCC 100 control. We're gonna talk about that a little bit further along in this presentation here. Keep going on that. The furnace is actually what we're talking about today for the most part. Um, but it goes with all of our products. So we're going to add in a few different things there as we need to. The Bosch furnace itself is a 96% AFUE gas furnace. It has a 10-year warranty on it. Out of the box. We'll do a little bit more about warranty and where we go with that as we go to, as we get in a little deeper. Some of the installation features, it goes great with our IDS heat pumps and air conditioning systems. Um, and you can use our IDS stuff. If you want it just for air conditioning only, you can do that. Just don't use the heat pump part of it. Just don't hook up that wire. Simple. Um, this furnace here has a two-stage gas valve. You can switch between high and low fire as needed in order to maintain the proper temperatures. Um, that gas valve itself can either be switched through a multi-stage thermostat or it can be switched through a timed um, trip switch or dip switch in our control. So we can actually run it on a single stage thermostat as a two-stage gas valve where it will time the second stage in. The furnace itself is a three-way or three-position furnace. It can go horizontal left, upright, horizontal right. There are a few things we'll have to move around and then I'll try to get into those a little bit as we go. Um, Multi-speed ECM 13 motor, super efficient motor. Multi-speed available. We can adjust speeds um, by changing a couple of contacts around to accommodate pretty much any ductwork you might have. Of course, we have to have a reasonable or reasonably well-designed ductwork we can accommodate a few different static pressures just by changing up some of those. Spots. We have a real short cabinet here. Makes it kind of nice when we're dealing with um, replacement situations where they might have a an older furnace in there with a coil on top. We take our furnace is a little bit shorter than most, and it gives a little extra room for that ductwork for those change outs. So you're not going to have to, oftentimes not going to have to the complete plenum. You may just have to 
shaft up to it or maybe cut the old one back. Our new coil is on the top of this. Our fault codes are displayed on an LED on the circuit board itself. I believe there's 13 of those fault codes that show up. And you'll see those through the, the bottom window on this, this little window on the bottom door. And if you look in there before turning power off and resetting, see a little light in a little flash, and it'll flash one through 13, a series of different codes. Record that before you reset or take that bottom door off. Once you take the bottom door off, open the switch, turn the power off, and as soon as you turn it back on, that those fault codes all reset. So try to get those prior to that. Try to keep an eye on what's going on, if you can. Um, if not, there's other ways to troubleshoot it. And we can find that. So we can go either right-hand or left-hand connection on the gas line. Pretty industry standard, doesn't matter which side we come in. Pretty easily, there's plenty of room in there to work. Every single unit comes through with a conversion kit for LP gas. So it comes through as natural, and it is convertible easily to LP. Some of the selling points are, every single furnace is an Energy Star rated. So every furnace, these 96 furnaces, all qualify for all of the energy rebates that might be out there in your particular state. Um, our website has a energy rebate um, page on it, so to speak, where you can type in your state, your zip code, and find out what rebates might be available. So certainly something to look for. Um, and if you look around and look at how to do this, if you pair it correctly, our IDS heat pump, um, either IDS-1 or IDS-2, but in certain combinations, um, state of Massachusetts had up to about a $4,700 rebate on this, um, on these combinations. So you can go heat pump, air conditioning, with a furnace and a control, and pretty much pay for the equipment just in rebates. So keep an eye on those. It's certainly an easy selling point to the customer easy for you to sell, only paying for your labor, and your profit, of course. Um, they do meet all of the, or some of the Energy Star requirements in different combinations. We're gonna get into that a little bit. I've got a couple of charts here, and those are in the instructions that go with it as well, um, as to what holds what ratings, what SEER ratings or energy ratings are in these combinations of heat pump furnace, um, coils, that type of thing. And our BCC thermostat family will work well with this as a, as a two-stage heat only. We can do two-stage heat, two-stage cooling. We can do heat pump, cooling, heat pump with fossil fuel backup. Those are different things with those BCC controls. So if we look at our complete system, we're gonna take our gas furnace, we're going to pair it up with an IDS case coil and with an IDS condenser, either the IDS 1, IDS 2.0. So the 1.0 is 18 sear, 2.0 is a 20 sear, um, multi speed. Yeah. Compressor, condenser. Um, and I can't remember what the words I was looking for on that one. So I a little leg on my face there, but I'll think of it. A little modulating, but we'll get there. Thanks. All right. So we look at how to actually determine what's going on and, and what our guys actually look for. And it will help you out if you're looking at these things on a job or buying. Um, the B is for Bosch, of course. G happens to be gas furnished. Um, H tells me it's got a gas valve and a fan motor. 96 is the efficiency. The M is the orientation for multi-poise. Capacity on it is 60,000 BTUs on that particular one, up to 120 sizes there. Cabinet widths, we do have three different size cabinet widths, depending on what you're buying and what you need. Our cooling capacity that the fan on the unit and the size of the unit will handle series number of 
that. Do the same thing in our case coils as the positioning, what shape coil it is, what tonnage it is, what the cabinet is. And I mentioned we do have three different cabinet widths, so we do have three different A coils to go with those. Um, white type of refrigerant, does it have a TXV in it? The tube diameters, either seven millimeter and nine millimeter in this particular case. Then when we get into the outdoor units, again, kind of the same thing goes on here as far as what it is. It's a Bosch, it's a condenser. The series, the capacity, it's a heat pump. Tells us what's in it for a refrigerant, what the power supply is, efficiencies. And in our IDS-1, it's a Mitsubishi brand compressor. In our IDS-2, those are almost the same identical things. We follow it with a G for a GMCC compressor. So the IDS-1 uses a Mitsubishi compressor and Mitsubishi board. The IDS-2 uses our GMCC compressor and our um, branded board or GMCC actually makes that for us. The Furnace specs, size-wise, the three different cabinet sizes and, and different BTU out, um, range that we have. We go from 60, 80 to 100 to 150,000 BTUs with three cabinet sizes. So we offer the 60 and the 80 in a 17 and a half inch width. All of those cabinets, the depth is 28 and a half, and all of them are the same height at the 33 and three quarters high. The next size up, we have an 80,000 with that wider cabinet into a 21 inch cabinet, as well as a 100,000 in the 21. We go up the next size to 100,000 in the larger cabinet, we're able to do a larger AC loader or air handling ability, and then our 120 in that 24 and a half. Again, all three of those cabinets are still 28 deep, or 28 and a half, um, 33 and three quarters tall. All of those have the same orientation. The only one we can't do is down. We cannot run down flow in a condensing furnace, at least not in our configuration. This is the IDS-1 or BOVA-1 um, combinations that meet the Energy Star ratings in the two tons using an outdoor, three ton outdoor unit with a two ton, two and a half ton case coil or our three ton case coil. We can actually run the Sears up in the, into the Energy Star ranges at 18 and 16 and a half respectively. From there, if we go into a three ton with the other coils or we go into a four ton with the other coils, we actually lose some of that energy star rating. Something to look for if you're looking for rebates. When we get into the IDS 2.0, our sear rating is a little higher and we have more combinations. So we can actually do um, two, three, four, and five ton out of that, out of those different combinations. We have two outdoor units, a three ton and a five ton those with different air handlers, different coils, different furnaces. So if we look in that third column over where our furnace model is here, these are the different combinations with our furnace that we can use to meet the Energy Star and get those rebates. So that's fairly important. And these are these should all be in the manuals um, so that you can pick them out. They're also available on our sites. Get into the installation itself. Um, we like the, the Bosch BCC controls. These are a Wi-Fi enabled thermostat. Um, we'll do outdoor reset. We'll do all kinds of different setbacks and can be controlled off of an app either on your phone or iPad from a remote location. So the house can will have these devices in it. Um, can be used in multi-zones, 
um, depending on what you're doing, it's a on off connection out of all the things. It's not a, uh, it's not a data type device. It's an on off connected device and doesn't require either one of these requires an outdoor sensor. They work on the internet temperatures for your location based on what your internet is. So you just punch in where you are. The internet brings up what the temperature might be in your location. How oh, these work. So the BCC 100 we have and the BCC 50 we have, which is a little smaller price point. Um, the 100 is the full screen one. All of the programming on the 100 can be done right on screen. Whereas the BCC 50, we can turn it up and down and do a couple of things on the screen. Most of the programming is done through the app on the 50. That's a new control. Like I said, great price point on that. And they're available right through us. Um, also available on Amazon. Electrical diagrams for using our controls. And it pretty much works with anybody's control. These are what's required. So there's only four wires to the outside unit. And if we're running two stage for everything, it's seven wires or eight to the indoor unit. So our G wire comes in and runs the fan, our Y wire, Y1 and Y2, it's both ways to run um, first and second stage. A little note on our um, common wires in all of our products, Brown is actually our common, so it kind of confuses. Sometimes when you get into these, you take covers off and you can't find that you're looking for a white common that a lot of companies use. We use brown them, pretty much everything for our commons. Um, the OB terminals for our reversing valve, we energize our reversing valves on, on B or on heat. So it's something to remember. Um, we always energize on heat. And our BCC50 uses the same wiring, and it uses the same sub base, so it can be switched around pretty easily. Um, all of the same parameters, the humidify and dehumidify on both of these um, can be hooked up and run in two different seasons. So we can actually go into the control itself, and program and humidify for the wintertime and dehumidify for the summertime something that's easily programmed into those controls. Into a little bit of gas conversion here. Um, and there is a few questions on it or has been a few questions on it. Try to see if I can keep that down just a little bit. All right, so we got our burner box and all of the different burner orifices. The easiest way for me to explain this is some have three some have four, some have five. This is all dependent on size. Simply a matter of taking four screws out, tilting that manifold over, pulling the old orifices out, the new orifices that come with the kit in. Um, just install those gas orifices, and then we go to the gas valve itself. We install a couple of springs and change those out. So those, Springs are both in, one in high fire and one in low fire. This is a plastic regulator adjustment screw or a little plug in there. For me, I kind of like to count the turns. They tell me 10. Um, so 10 from where we start in from kind of flush with the outside face of that regulator will get you to start. And then you're going to go to the back of the door itself to set up your manifold pressure once everything is set up in. Um, something to note on the regulator springs, and, and I don't have a photograph of it up here, it's unfortunate. Um, but something to note on those springs is in the bag um, for the LP conversion kit, those springs sometimes will marry together and look like a single spring. Um, Hopefully they don't for you and it makes your life easy. But if they do, take a really close look at those springs and see if you can separate the two springs. Um, we haven't had any so far that really did not have two springs in the conversion kit. Got a lot of calls on whether or not there was an, a spring missing. 
some guys actually installed that doubled up spring and had a hard time trying to reset or set their manifold pressures on there. So watch out for the springs in this. A little troubleshooting basics. It's difficult for me to get in from here on a webinar into all of the troubleshooting stuff, but there's good flow charts in the in the manual and in the troubleshooting guide. And those flow charts lead you into, at least in the troubleshooting guide, just different pictures or locations of where you're going to do your testing. So when you're checking for 120 volts, it's actually 115 to 125, whatever it happens to be, whatever's normal in our area. Um, so 120 volts plus or minus 10%, right? On our board, we've got L1, and then our neutrals are all in the same block. We have to make sure we have that. So that's the first thing we're going to check. Is there actually power to the unit? We have it there. Um, the door switch, is that door switch closed? Easy enough to figure out. Terminal's off it. Click it back and forth with a multimeter on it, checking resistance. All you're doing is just checking to see if it has continuity in that door switch. Make sure that that's working sure it's closed. Door switch isn't closed, no power. So with the bottom door open, I'll take a, a clip, paper clip, piece of tape, something to that effect. I have to have the bottom door open. Flip that switch in so I know it, that I have a good power source going through that safety switch. We're going to check for low voltage next. And what sends our low voltage is our 18 to 31 volt transformer. We'll look for that power to see if we actually have it. So we're going to see if we got 120 volts in the one side of the transformer, 18 to 31 volts AC outgoing side of the transformer. We're actually going to see if the board is sending that power out and see how that all goes. So those two highlighted terminals under number one there, the R and C, See if we have that same voltage, 18 to 31. So is that is that board actually working and sending that signal out? Next components. So the basics. Do we have power coming in? Do we have power to the transformer? Do we have 18 to 31 at the transformer and at the board? Once we know that, then we can determine whether or not we've got issues with different controls, something uh, external, perhaps. Um, thermostat doesn't energize and our fan terminals g and c we're looking for 18 to 31 volts there at g and c that's for your fan okay. do we actually have a call for heat is it going to turn the unit on um w1 and c that's our call for heat tt without tt connected we're done so if we don't have any power out of that board going up there, we may not have it. So do we have a call for heat? Do we have a call for the fan? Those working. Um, and then we go into the rest of the heating part, parts of this. Is Do we have actually have power out to the fan motor? That's where to test it on that board. Some of the other components you're going to check. If you don't, if you have power to everything, Everything seems to energize. We go into the pre-purge on this. Pre-purge runs for about, uh, I think it's about 60 seconds, 90 seconds, I believe. Um, at that point, we should actually start to ignite this, and we should see this igniter start to glow. It's pretty easy to see, even with the cover on, just looking through the window. You'll see that igniter glowing. It's pretty hot. We're looking for 9 to 17 ohms on those two terminals disconnected from everything else. If we have that 9 to 17 ohms, we should have a good igniter. Um, so we have the right resistance there. Next thing we're going to look for is do we have a, a power supply to the igniter. Do we have 115, 120 volts at the board itself for the ignition? Just after the pre-purge, while we go into that 15 second preheating um, sequence. So we're going to check for 120 volts there. That 120 volts at that board or that plug should be going directly up to that igniter. 
And then once we've proven the ignition and we have the igniter, send 18 to 31 volts out to the M and the high and the C terminals. So M being our low fire or main, um, high being our high fire, second stage, and our C, which is our common. So that goes out to there. Do we have that signal going to that gas valve? It's actually getting power to the gas valve. So once we've established that we have power at the board going out, we're gonna power the fan, we're gonna power the combustion blower, prove things there, make sure we have an igniter, make sure we have a signal to our gas valve. Um, grounding on this is pretty critical. In the event that you have a two wire system, some of the older houses, grounding becomes very, very critical. We prove all of our flame rectification through ground. So if we don't have any grounds or we don't have grounds that are connected back to our neutrals in some way, we don't prove at the control. So make sure your grounds are good, both on the unit and both coming into that unit. Um, in the event, that you may not have a ground in an older house, something to that effect, something that's wired incorrectly, whatever it happens to be. You may have to get an, either an electrician in there or do it yourself. Um, you may have to bring a new wire right from the panel all the way over to the burner itself or, or the furnace itself so that we actually maintain that ground. Without it, we're likely gonna have a lot of false um, lockouts for no ignition or no flame proof. Always check your grounding on that. All right. So something that happens in the pre-purge part of this thing is we have to prove that we actually have a good draft across the burners and out through the venting itself. One of those things is um, blockages in the condensate hoses. Any of those hoses are blocked up. We're not going to prove it. We're not going to. We're not going to actually make that pressure switch, and that won't allow the igniter to come on and the gas valve to open. So make sure those are clear. Our condensate box on our secondary heat exchanger actually shows or is an open or clear box, so we can actually see what condensate levels might be in that box, Take things from there. Um, hoses do get plugged up with debris. You oftentimes find um, bugs and, and other debris in there. Time to clean that if you're seeing that. So time to open things up, clean out that heat exchanger, blow it out, um, and then get condensate drains in order for that. Check for your blockages. Check those the switches, make sure you have the correct resistance or continuity through the switch. Make sure that that's all working correctly. And those pressure switches are pretty simple. They're on and off. Um, they're on and off at certain pressures, but they're either made or they're not. So if they're not made, you know, look for why. Do we not have enough airflow? Do we have something in a blocked vent? Do we have something in a blocked hose uh, themselves, just the hose. Is there some junk in one of the draft hoses or in the condensate hoses? These are where the different switches are located. That high fire and low prior pressure switch will need to be moved for certain orientations on this. If we turn this thing on one side, we're okay. If we turn it on the other side, we actually have to move those pressure switches around and relocate so that they're not at the bottom of that unit. See, if we went to a left-hand horizontal, those switches would be at the bottom. We're gonna move those around to change their position around a little bit if we do that left-hand. Again, covered right in the manual pretty easily. Okay, then we have some rollout switches, one on each side of the burner box, right at the top of the unit. Um, those rollout switches open on a temperature rise. When they open, when it shuts down, we don't have any more ignition, we don't have any more gas valve, we drop things out. 
a little safeties that are involved in this. So that is a fixed limit. It's not a manual reset limit. It will reset automatically. So it's not a one-time lockout. As soon as things cool down, it will reopen or reclose, I should say, and then remake, we'll turn that unit back on. So test continuity through there. Um, if the switch is cold and you figure that it may have been in that switch, try to duplicate that situation. Try to keep the cover back on. Maybe you clip a couple of leads to there to see what's going on with that and see if that switch is actually what's taking you out. So that switch is located up there. We also have a couple of other limit switches in here. Make on a break on a rise, make on a fall. One of them is right behind the gas valve. The other one's on the side of the blower fan right behind the PCB board. Um, those switches as well have to be checked for resistance to see if they're open. So if we have a cabinet that's too um, either way, either in the top of the cabinet or in the blower compartment, we actually turn the burners off so we don't cook the heat up. So some of the questions we might have, and there's there's a few of them. There's a multitude of questions, um, just a couple. So if we're using a single stage thermostat, can we still run and work with two stages? Yes, absolutely. On the circuit board itself, there is a dip switch there that time delays and it will upstage according to that delay. So single stage regular thermostat unit will come on go through its purges, will light, run free, predetermined length of time. And then the board, if we set that dip switch correctly, will time that in and run that second stage up. LP gas, yes, absolutely, we can use that with this. Has everything there and part of the LP gas kit, or conversion kit that I neglected to mention a little while ago was the label itself, we don't, if you convert it from natural to LP, you do not change the label. You've not met code, not properly converted that. The next guy that comes through the door needs to know what happened and what, what was done to this. So you need to see that label on, to say what kit, tells you what kit went in it, what pressures there are. And again, all of those pressures, if you guys are looking for manifold pressures on these, they're on the back of the doors, so you can't lose them. Lose the door well, problem there. Um, some of the applications that we do not allow, mobile homes, RVs, some outdoor applications. They're not approved for mobile home or, or some HUDs. RVs, definitely not. Um, outdoor or garage type applications where we have um, cold return air all the time. We have a hard time getting rid of the condensate in the primary heat exchanger with below 60 degree return air. So we don't want to see a continuous operation with those cold airs. So a garage situation such as mine here, um, I can't use it because I like to keep the garage at 45 or 50 during the winter just to take the chill off. Um, but I don't run, I really don't want to heat it above 60. And in order to use this furnace, I need that 60 degrees once we've heated things up as a continuous return temp, right? So yeah, which furnace do we recommend? You're gonna do some sizing, right? Um, what's the load of the house? Do a, do a heat loss on the house, check the windows, the doors, so on. And use some of the resources that are out there. Manual J is the older bunch of resources for sizing and heat load. Know that if you're in an existing or older house, that somebody else may have come in there and changed the furnace out once or twice and decided that bigger's better. So if we have a choice between one that's little small and one that's way bigger, let's go to the way bigger. Um, the reality is that that's happened for many, many years. And most of you in the trades have, have heard the across the street heat load we did, um, you would go across the street, hold your hand up, and if three fingers covered the house, you needed that size furnace. If four fingers, then you needed a 
bigger one. Um, those heat loss methods don't work well uh, in most cases. And my point here is that oftentimes things have been changed out a couple of times and maybe upsized. And at the same time, the house may have been updated substantially, blown in insulation in the in the attic up to R60 or foam in the walls, um, new windows, new doors, um, air sealing, that type of thing. So when you're replacing an existing, do some homework, do a little bit of, of work on it, do a quick measurement of the house. What the, what's the duct work? What's there? Is it enough? Will it handle everything that you're doing? Um, your installation is only as good as what's already there. And if you do not pay attention to what's there, you could be putting a unit in that's perfect and everything is sized correctly and works great. But the existing conditions may be so far out of line that no matter what you put in there, quality wise or size wise, it won't do the job. So do a little bit of homework, do some sizing, and check out what is needed. Sell that to the customer. It's an easy upsell. Um, we do have an 80% furnace. Um, it's pretty much out at this point. We introduced it into the market. It didn't sell well. It was introduced mostly to do to do backup heat. Um, some of the southern or mid states, mid Atlantic states, uh, where we might have 40 degree um, winter weather, something to that effect, or 30 degree, where it can't handle all of the outdoor temps when it gets that low just need a little bit of supplemental heat. That's what the 80% was designed for. It just never really took off, mostly because the 96% furnaces come with such rebates, it doesn't pay to use the 80. The 96 is almost paid for in rebates. So a lot of guys use that. And frankly, the 96 is, is a much better unit. So we did come out with that. It's working quite well. Like I said, again, um, do your sizing, make sure that's correct. That'll make you shine um, about probably half of the, or, or more than half of the installations that don't work correctly are not the fault of the equipment, they're the fault of the installation. So make sure your installation is perfect. Our equipment's good. And if our equipment's coupled with your installation, you won't have the callbacks, you won't have the headaches that go along with that. into a little bit of warranty five years parts 20 years on the primary and secondary heat exchanger and if you register that on our site in 60 days of the install you're going to get 10 years on parts and a limited lifetime on the heat exchanger so you're going to double things up limited lifetime is prorated after a certain amount of time um, if you're an abc contractor little bit of that. But if you're a Bosch accredited or accredited Bosch contractor, an ABC guy, and you register within 30 days, you get an additional year on parts. So you'll have 11 years on parts that you can offer to your customer. Nobody else can. So ABC has, that's one of their little benefits that, that ABC actually has. No additional labor on the furnace. Um, it's 90 days on labor. After that, um, the standard warranty has that. So www.boshprohvac is where you're going to register these. And any warranty claims that you might have on it are going to go right through your wholesaler, right through your distributor. They've got to have an account with Bosch. And if you've bought it there, they have an account with Bosch. Um, they're going to go through and submit those warranty claims for you and deal with our warranty department. It should be pretty seamless. It should work out quite well for you guys. It's a good, uh, a good operation there now. Our warranty departments uh, years ago weren't up to the standards that they are now, and they've certainly worked quite hard to get them up to where they are now. Doing quite well with that. As far as spare parts goes, all of our parts are stocked. Um, 
either in New Hampshire or Illinois. Um, all your distributors should be able to get all of the parts they need. They should have most of the basics in stock. Um, we do not yet have a parts kit for the furnace. Um, we're working on coming up with that, but as of right now, we don't have an assembled parts kit, something that you can buy a kit. But in the manual itself, when you get into the parts section of that, it shows you what the most used parts are. So you should be able to stock those. Um, I would say an igniter, maybe a control board, maybe a fan and combustion motor, um, those things there that are that are possibly going to go bad. So they might want to be something that's that's stocked. In the event that you cannot get parts easily or somebody doesn't have them in stock, they they can be had by calling into our 800 number um, or going into our spare parts email, spareparts.bosch-climate.us. Um, we'll get you to where you can find those parts. We can ship out next day. And go through your distributor to get into that. As long as your distributor has an account, do it. There's also the possibility of processing direct credit cards for you guys. You're going to pay list price for that service. Sometimes you have to have that right off. So easy way to get parts in an emergency and be done. Like I said, they can, we can next day that stuff right out of our warehouses. A little about our ABC program. You do get the extended one year warranty on that. On our website, our Bosch Pro HVAC website, um, you're going to be listed on there, the customer or homeowner. You can go in, type in the zip code for their region and your name if you're in their region with a distance from their zip code will come up. Um, so it helps with your lead generation, helps get things going, a little bit extra support there. Priority technical support is a big thing when you call tech support if you're an ABC. I pass whatever line or, or call numbers that are in the queue. So if there might be 10 calls in the queue, you're next. Um, if you're number 11, but you're an ABC and you're the only ABC guy. Go to the front of that line. Also some discounts, some promotions, a lot of different things that happen there. Um, we have a, a bunch of different programs, better training, um, easier training to get to. So all through our Bosch Pro system. If you're not an ABC contractor, look into it. It's It's got some certain benefits. Um, make your life pretty good. When you're getting into brochures and stuff, Bosch, www. Yeah, www.boschheatingcooling.com slash brochures. What are your residential solutions when you get there? Click on that or commercial, depending on what you're looking for, and that'll get you to those literature. So all of our literature should be there. You'll find technical bulletins, service bulletins, things that come up um, that you may not have known about. So something you can check on every once in a while if you've got a problem or issue. Look and see if there's a TSB on the thing, and if there is, open it up. It should tell you just how to take care of that. And then our E Academy which is something fairly new to us. We're gonna have a new training, eAcademy. You're gonna be able to go in and, and look and sign up online on our eAcademy. So you'll be able to take some classes there. So that's www.training.boshprohvac.com. That's about it for what I got today. I'm open for questions if you guys have got any. I see there's still a few people. 